You're listening to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast, episode 44, hosted by me, Robert Plotkin. Today, I'm going to be speaking with John DeGraff, an author, filmmaker, speaker, and activist who's returning to the podcast for an encore appearance. John's mission is to help people to have a happy, healthy, and sustainable quality of life. Today, we're going to focus on how beauty can help put people back in touch with the natural world, with themselves, and with each other. For more information about John's work in this area, check out his organization, And Beauty for All, at andbeautyforall.org. We're extremely pleased to welcome back John DeGraff to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. In the upcoming interview you're about to hear with John DeGraff, you'll hear us talk about that experience that we've all had and seen in others where we're somewhere and are so focused on taking pictures of our experience or videos or blogging about it or otherwise capturing it that we fail to really be focused on experiencing that experience itself in the moment. So today's tip is very simple. It's that when you are somewhere, particularly someplace new, maybe that's exciting or at a party or other event where you're having a good time and you feel that urge to document your experience, see if you can pay attention to the urge and at the very least make a conscious decision about whether to essentially exit the experience temporarily so that you can document it by snapping that photo or to stay in it, stay in it directly. And one other practical tip I can provide to try to strike a balance between being in your experience directly and documenting it, and we all love having pictures and videos and, and things that we write about our experience. We all love having those things. I'm not suggesting that you stop doing them entirely, is maybe decide in advance when you're going to take a picture, like at the beginning of an event or at a very special moment in it or at the end, or perhaps you're going to designate one person at a party to be the photographer and only that person will be taking pictures so that everyone else can focus on just the experience and have that designated photographer uh, agree to share all the photos afterwards so that everyone can relax. These are just a couple of practical tips for trying to strike a balance and trying to be more present directly in our experience in the moment as we're living it. And you'll hear us talk more about that in the upcoming interview with John DeGraff. Hi, John, and welcome back to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on your program again. Yeah, really enjoyed having you the last time. And uh, I think we can talk about an infinite number of things, but today we're going to focus a bit more on on beauty and how it can help us all reconnect both with the natural world and with each other. And I thought we might start out by talking a little bit about how in our own lives, technology can sometimes get in the way of that kind of connection with, with each other and the, and the beauty in the natural world. Sure. Yeah. With other things regarding technology, I think it can be something of a double-edged sword. It certainly has its positives, but it has its, its negatives. With regard to beauty, I think uh, technologies and even some of the new social platforms like Instagram, um, they, they have the positive impact of people sharing beautiful photos. People go out and, and they walk here in Washington State where I live, young people go on hikes and they share all those photos on Instagram. And that gets a lot of other young people excited about going out on hikes as well. So we've seen a tripling of the use of trails here in five years. And people call it actually the Instagram effect. Now, it's not all good because some of the trails get too crowded and sometimes people all go to the same place. Uh, and so uh, the parking lots are full and uh, 
other issues come into play. But it is getting people out there uh, in, into nature, which is an important thing, because the other side of technology uh, with all the digital gadgets, in particular for children, is that they stay inside all the time on their computers or on their devices uh, and don't get out and play, don't get out into the natural world uh, the way that we did when I was a kid. So um, there's two things there. And we, we certainly know it's, it's hugely important for children to uh, get out in nature for all of us, in fact, for health and everything else. And we also know that, that the amount that kids do that has dropped dramatically, maybe as much as a half in a, in in a, one generation alone. Uh, it's now estimated that children only spend about one half hour a week outdoors, uh, unstructured. Wow, that is shocking. I knew that it was a small amount of time, but yeah, that that's really a shocking number. I mean, uh, as you said, it is a double-edged sword. I can relate to some of the the benefits of taking pictures. I have no sense of direction, but I love hiking. And when I go online now and see trails posted where people have posted pictures of the, you know, uh, landmarks uh, and other ways to get around the trail, it gives me confidence yeah. <laughs> to go out on a trail much more than a written description of where to turn, which often is not that helpful to me. <laughs> well, I, I think that that's true. And my, my son likes to use his device that way. He's always kind of on top of where to go. I used to kind of like the adventure of the topographical map and and uh, the compass and all that sort of stuff. But, uh, you know, the, the point is getting people out there and, uh, you know, and it's, I assuming that they're not using the technical advices also to be e uh, emailing while they're walking or doing all kinds of other things, but just using it uh, when they need it for directions. I, I think that's totally fine. But you really I really want people looking at the landscape. You know, I want, want people enjoying with all of their senses the uh, appreciating nature because that's when it does the most for our health and for our, our well-being. Yeah, and it's certainly a challenge. I mean, we've all experienced and a lot's been been written and said about the phenomenon of people being so focused on capturing their current experience that they're not really experiencing it while it's happening. You know, focusing on taking pictures or posting on, on social media in real time while they're somewhere. Yeah, and let, let me give you an example of that. You know, Yosemite is kind of my favorite place on earth. I spent a lot of time there as a kid. I, I still try to get back there. I live on the West Coast, so it's not so hard. I try to get back there once every two or three years. And I've noticed a phenomenon now where at the prominent viewpoints as you come into Yosemite Valley, people don't even really wait to look at the scene. They mm -hmm. have their... Uh, iPhone or camera, usually a phone nowadays, but, but cameras as well, they have them up to their eyes and ready to shoot before they've actually surveyed uh, the view. And so the first look they have at the El Capitan or uh, Bridal Veil Falls or these beautiful sites in Yosemite Valley uh, is through the lens, you know, and there's something troublesome about that. Uh, and then the picture is snapped quickly. Sometimes they don't even get out of the car. The car just drives slowly enough that you can take the picture without blurring. And now you can take them a lot quicker without blurring with iPhones and so forth. So they don't even get out of the car. Uh, it's been there, shot that, and on to quickly to the next destination. Uh, that's not uh, experiencing nature in my book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's very challenging. It, it takes some conscious intention and effort to uh, to experience nature another way. I mean, one one way to do it would be to just leave the technology at home. I find it beneficial to have it with me, but as you said, to to really limit the way in which you use it so that it's not detracting from your direct experience with nature. I think that's the important thing. I'm not telling people to leave it at home and they do want the photos and the memories and and to share those. And that's great because they're beautiful things and they do also encourage other people to do it. But, you know, give it a little and at least enough time to take a serious look <laughs> at what you're seeing <laughs> before you, you know, now when you can snap a million photographs and it doesn't matter, you know, it used to be at least with the old cameras, 
you know, you'd have to be careful. You'd have to plan what you're shooting and things like that because, you know, you you had 12 or 16 or how many, uh, you know, shots for each role or 24, you know, and, um, uh, you know, that was it. So you had to be a little bit cautious and at least look at what you're seeing before you started to shoot. But now you can just bring the thing up and you, you can be snapping this thing as you're moving your eyes around with the device in front of your eyes, you know? And so it's, it's a whole different world that we have to be more conscious about how we use it. Yeah. I wonder if we can, we can take a step back, you know, and talk about some of your own personal experience throughout your life that, that brought you to have an appreciation of beauty in the natural world and sure. you know, why you're returning to it now as something that you feel is very important to, to bring back. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I think my, my life has really been spent making films, writing and doing speaking and so forth around I, the, the whole idea of quality of life, that it shouldn't be about the amount of stuff we have. It should be about the overall quality of our lives. And that includes health and happiness and social connection and, and access to art and beauty and those kind of things, as well as the material side of it. You know, I'm not saying no material side, but but we, we tend to forget the other part of life that's important, and we don't really measure it in our gross domestic product. And I think where I came to those ideas uh, lies in the fact that at, from a very young age, about 10, uh, my dad took me backpacking. And again, I, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, and so he taught me to backpack when I was 10. And, and by the time I was 14, he'd also taught uh, my best friend how to backpack. And so the summer after uh, our first year of high school, we were only 14 years old, almost 15. But uh, my dad took us up to Yosemite and dropped us off uh, with our backpacks and said, you know, you're on your own for two and a half weeks and call uh, once a week, collect to let us know you didn't die. And uh, my friend's parents picked us up at the end of two and a half weeks. That was uh, when I was 14. From that time on, from 15 to 17, each summer after high school, my friend and we added a couple of other friends, we, we got to go to the mountains for six weeks on our own completely. And we would hike, uh, backpack around. We'd go for you know a week at a time in the back country, come back out to a road hitchhike to a little town and restock our supplies and go back in. And what I learned by doing that, I think, is what I would call now the backpacker's theory of life. Hmm. I don't know if you, you've you seen or your your listeners have seen a, the movie called Wild with Reese Witherspoon. But um, it's an interesting, it's a film about a young woman who wants to, to walk the Pacific Crest Trail from Mexico to Canada, 2,600 miles. And when she starts... Her backpack is so full of stuff, she has put into it everything she can imagine, <laughs> possibly imagine she would need on the trail. She even has a battery-powered hair dryer. <laughs> uh, and she puts this pack on her back, and she falls over backwards. She can't even stand up. And so she's like a beetle or a turtle that can't turn itself over uh, and flailing until she can extricate herself and realizes she has to get rid of a lot of things before she starts to hike. And I th that's the first lesson of backpacking is balance. You know, you there are things you really need, and you can have too little of them. You've got to have enough food and water. Uh, in early summer in the mountains, you better have mosquito repellent or you get eaten alive. But the bigger problem for most backpackers is that they try to take too much. They assume that they need. A, and then it, it's painful. It's misery to, to try to do that. So you find balance. And you also realize that you can be happy. You can have a good quality of life in backpacking very simply because what you have is companionship of your friends and the wonderful people you usually meet on the trail. And then, uh, you know, this healthy feeling that comes from good exercise, the sense of control over your time. Can't do that all the time because we have to work to make a living. But it, it does give us a taste of that kind of freedom. And I would call that freedom. Uh, and you have this wonderful experience of beauty and of being out in the natural world and seeing just how beautiful it is in its more uh, pristine forms. It's certainly not totally pristine, but, but more like it was. And all of those experiences make you realize, wow, that's what really matters in life. And balance, as the Greeks and everybody understood, is the important thing. Not too much, not too little. 
Uh, but as a society, what I would argue is that uh, we've completely forgotten that lesson. Uh, America is like a backpacker who has this enormous backpack on that's already kind of twice the size of America and um, is not happy. Uh, in fact, getting unhappier by the year, according to UN statistics. And yet we think the answer to this is what we call more economic growth. And so we, uh, in undifferentiated fashion, try to pile more and more stuff into our backpack, uh, you know, and, and not even worrying about what it is and, and not realizing that it's weighing us down, it's pulling us backward, we've fallen over, we can't make progress, we are struggling, our straps are digging in as we lay there unable to turn over, and we are mad, damn it, I mean, and we are mad because of all of this, and we're blaming minorities, gays, blacks, women, taxes, regular, we're blaming everything for this predicament that we are in, except, uh, these priorities that that got us there in the first place. So that those were the big. That was my introduction to beauty was as a backpacker, and it was an introduction to all the most important lessons I think I've learned in my life. I really love that metaphor. The image is really striking of the person, as you said, like a turtle or a beetle on their back. You know, just weighed down too much. And as you said, it it really does rub up against a very strong cultural value we have that says more is always better, right? And you, right. you started talking about the, the camera, which now has essentially unlimited memory. And we see that as inherently better. You'd never see a new iPhone come back and say new and improved, less memory. Right? Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, we don't seem to learn the lesson that sometimes less can give us more more freedom or, or, or more happiness, at least less stuff. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, we have to know what it is. When, when I hear a politician, which you just hear from both parties constantly, and we heard it again in the State of the Union speech, our economy is growing faster than ever before. We grew 4%. We're going to grow more than 4%, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I kind of want to throw up, because, uh, but mainly I want to ask, well, wait a minute. Are you talking just growth of this GDP, which is this number that measures everything from it positively, including cleaning up oil spills and cancer costs and all of this kind of stuff? Or are you talking about something different? And I, I know they're just talking about GDP. And so what I'm saying is, OK, growth, tell me at least what should grow, what we need more of as a society, and then tell me what, in fact, should shrink and can shrink. And I think there are a lot of things that can shrink, uh, you know, but I think we need to, we need more leisure time. We don't measure that, but that, that should grow. Uh, we need more uh, social connection and caring. Uh, we need more attention to preserving and protecting nature and beauty. Those things should count and they should grow. And we certainly need less of, you know, um, you know, huge vehicles and all kinds of kinds of things like this. I mean, I could could name a, a zillion things. I would also argue that uh, we could use uh, a little less military spending and things like that. But um, you know, and if those things sh shrank, I don't know what GDP would show. It might actually show show degrowth and degrowth that was was positive for the quality of our lives. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, even when you say shrink or degrowth, there's a part of me internally, the American in me, that sh that shrinks at it <laughs> as a negative, instinctive reaction to the just the concept of of shrinking it because we've standard. associated the yeah the idea of growth is positive, yes. growth is good. Uh, you know, and I don't know, you know, if you if you've uh, experienced or have, have experience with how to perhaps explain this to people or get across the, the ways in which shrinking is good, or maybe there are different words that can be used. <laughs> you, know, you talked about growing leisure time. Yeah, I talk about the specifics. I talk about, you know, what ought to be in our pack. What's, so, uh, or, or sometimes what's in our pack, but in a, in, in not the best of form. So I, I've talked to students about this and I'll ask them to play along with the metaphor and say, you know, what's missing from our backpack or what isn't as it should be in our backpack. And, you know, and they mention things like equality and, and 
care. And, 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 the, and, and then one of them says, well, we have a defective first aid kit. And I said, that's great. You are using the metaphor perfectly. You are, you are understanding that we have a healthcare system that's not doing the job, you know, but spending a lot more money on it isn't necessarily going to solve those problems. Uh, it, it, I mean, it's really important that we cover everybody, but it's also really important that we change our approach to health so that a lot more of it is about pre prevention in the first place. It's about changing aspects of our society that make Americans the least healthy people in rich countries. Because even if we cover everybody, it's going to be more expensive to do it here just because we're, we're, our health is so poor in comparison to other countries. We have way more chronic illness uh, you know, past the age of 60, 65 than other countries do. We have the shortest life expectancy, highest infant mortality, uh, you know, most stress, uh, you go through it. And so we have to take those things into account. I was pleased, and, and uh, it's probably obvious that I'm not a big fan of our president, but I was very pleased to hear him say in his State of the Union address that we should have paid family leave because we're the only country, rich country in the world that doesn't have it. And it's where this whole health thing starts for children. If children don't have a chance to bond with parents and the parents are going back to work after two weeks or a month and stuff, we see all kinds of both physical and mental health problems that eventually uh, are caused by that. And other countries know that. So that's a step in the right direction. We need to be thinking about things like that. Uh, as we also think about expanding health care to cover everybody. It's interesting. You know, you're talking about some concrete benefits to our health that could result from this shift towards a more balanced life, which would include more of a focus on beauty and being out in the natural world. Um, you know, th this strikes me as something that would appeal to Americans because we're so pragmatic, you know, for better or worse, we look for some concrete sure. benefit. I remember. Uh, attending a, a talk by Sharon Salzberg, who's written a lot about happiness. And she said she goes out and speaks to people in America. I always say oh, they, they, they just get confused by talk about happiness because they think it's too soft yeah. a topic to really be thinking hard about. Right. <laughs> and beauty, maybe beauty is the same way. It, it is at first. So it is this, it, the devil is in the details. It's, it's when you talk about the specifics that people can relate to in their own lives that these things uh, really make sense. And so, you know, one thing we know is important for us and good for us is exercise. But, and, and, and we respond to this by often spending money and going on a, a regimen to the gym over and over and over again. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do that in many cases because, you know, our health needs it. But on the other hand, uh, we could also get some of the same effect and some other positive effects by simply going out and walking distances in the park and things like that, where we would also have uh, nature around us rather than just a lot of uh, a lot of machines and a lot of sweaty people. Yeah, I'm always notice it uh, when I'm, if I'm not at the gym that much, but when I've been there, you know, people are watching videos. They're looking for some other right. stimulus than just the monotonous drone of being right. on a treadmill. You know, and you go on a hike and there's endless, endless uh, novelty and, and new experiences every step. Even if you're just walking, so to speak, the, the, what, what you experience around you, you can't, you can't even get something that compares to it on a, on a screen right. on a treadmill. No, I think that's exactly the case. And uh, which says to me that we ought to be creating more trails where people have these kind of opportunities. I mean... You know, a crowded country like the Netherlands, where I've been many times, there are a lot more trails and, and green space for people to, to walk, in my experience, than we, we find here because they've consciously devoted an effort to that. I think uh, Denmark, Germany, other 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 places are also uh, have become focused on that. And these are safe places for children to ride their bikes and to play and to be out in the in the natural world. And these are place cr countries much more crowded than we are. So it's harder for them to do it, but they make that effort because they know uh, that it counts. So I think, 
you know, I, I love things like the Rails to Trails organization, which is right, trying to connect the whole United States with uh, using these old railroad beds and turning them into to bike trails and stuff so that people can walk distance and uh, in the natural world without having to uh, worry about cars or any of those things that they can, they can bicycle. Uh, these, these kinds of things are wheel, wheelchair accessible. So that, uh, disabled people are not excluded from this kind of thing. And I think we need to do that We We need more to do more parks and, um, as we deal with inequality, for example, we need to realize that inequality isn't just about income, although I'm fully in favor of raising the minimum wage and, and dealing with income. But we, we need to realize that there's also an inequality of the spirit of, of these non-material things, which include access to nature, beauty, art. And so the city of Bogota, Colombia is a good uh, concrete example of a city that took this on uh the mayor enrique peñalosa in the 90s wanted to do something about inequality because inequality is pretty bad in colombia and the country was in the middle of war at the time but he said you know the first thing we need to do is make sure that people in our poor communities have healthier lives and have access to nature so bogota built 1200 new parks in the poorest parts of the city. Along with these parks, in many cases, they included beautiful new libraries with lots of books for, for people to have and community centers where people could come together. And then they uh, removed highway space and created trails and bike trails and all kinds of things. And then they went so far as to now uh, ban auto traffic completely in the city of Bogota from uh, until two, on Sundays until two o'clock in the afternoon. So if you go to Bogota now, uh, you will see thousands upon th thousands of people out on the roads, even walking on the freeways, having exercise classes in the on the streets, um, fully enjoying themselves, riding, walking with their kids and and so forth. And um, it's pretty um pretty amazing to see and it not only adds to health it adds to a great spirit of community it brings people together uh, so it's sort of thinking in this holistic picture and the way it's helped reduce inequality is that for the first time people in these poor barrios of bogota realized that somebody actually cared about them and how they lived and was interested in what they felt and that got those people really engaged, way beyond just the libraries and the parks, but politically engaged to fight for other things that matter to them. And wow, I mean, you're talking about a lot of a lot of amazing interconnected issues. Uh, you know, one of them is moving from what can we do individually, like get ourselves out into nature and hike, to what can or can only be done collectively. You know, by local or state or or national governments, because. When it comes to building parks or changing infrastructure, right, that's something that can only be done uh, collectively, but it can really have a, an impact that's so much greater than, than what any of us can do just, just for ourselves. I, you know, when you mentioned the car-free uh, cities, I was in Barcelona a couple of years ago. It was a business trip, and I was walking around, and oh, I loved it, and everyone else was out walking around, and as you said, it gives a real feeling of community. It took me a while to realize, oh, wait, there's no cars. I'm not walking with cars. And then to notice the, the, that low level of stress that I have walking in any city where there are cars was absent because I wasn't always on the lookout, even subconsciously, for a car. <laughs> it, had, it had unexpected impacts on me, uh, uh, you know, just above and beyond the fact that so many other people were out and there's such a positive energy amongst everyone being in a place that was designed for walking without cars. Absolutely. And, and, and we're seeing that in most big European cities today. You know, if uh, Budapest is a great example, there's a big street called the Vasi Utsa, which goes for, you know, a long way through the city. It's wide. It used to be a boulevard with all kinds of traffic. Now, completely no traffic. It's just shops, people walking, enjoying themselves. I saw this for the first time in 1997 when my film Affluenza came out, and I was invited to screen it at a, a film festival in Freiburg, Germany, 
Uh, it was the first time I'd ever been, only time I've ever been to Freiburg. But Freiburg was the first city to basically ban cars from its center. It did that because it was also the first city uh, in the world to elect a Green Party government. And that was one of the goals of the Green Party was get the cars out of the center of the city. Well, that originally caused enormous protests. Business didn't like it. They're claiming it was going to cost them all kinds of money. But it, it happened anyway. And within a couple of years, business realized this was a big benefit for them because people were walking and looking in their stores and, and things like that. So, uh, you know, I got to Freiburg and I realized the same phenomenon that you did. I mean, like, where are the cars? And wow. Isn't this pleasant? You know, it wasn't the whole city, of course, but and there were a few cars, but they were emergency vehicles, delivery trucks. And and so um, Zermatt, Switzerland, is an example of a town that is completely car free. And yet it's obviously one of the great tourist attractions in the world. People just love to be there, not only to see the Matterhorn, but because it's just a walkable, fun place to, to be without the cars. Yeah, it's amazing. And, you know, think about, so we're on this technology for mindfulness podcast, and it's easy to forget that architecture is a kind of technology, right? All the design in a city is a form of technology. It's not just modern uh, semiconductor based technology. That's technology. And all of that created environment can be something that's really conducive to mindfulness, even when the, the latest technology much of the time isn't. Yeah, and you, you know we've understood this forever. I mean, that, that's the, the the point is that we we don't pay much attention to this because it isn't the quickest may, way to make a buck for developers in our cities. But you know, a hundred plus years ago, beginning in uh, I think about eighteen ninety nine, we had a movement in the United States called City Beautiful, and it lasted until the First World War when a lot of important aspects of the so-called progressive era died with the First World War. But the idea behind City Beautiful was that cities should be transformed from these places of tenements and of of ugly polluting factories and turned into with lots of parks and trees for people's health and um, parkways and walkways and 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 public places where people could come together that were beautiful, that they enjoyed being in. And when I go out in Seattle, you know, I can see the the impact of City Beautiful because all of our parks and great strings of parks and stuff in this city were constructed during the City Beautiful period. So we understood then the importance of nature, and and the importance of, of places where people could come together without automobiles. Yeah. Um, I want to shift just a little bit. We've talked quite a bit about how beauty, and now we're talking a bit about the constructed environment, can help people just generally feel better, feel more connected with each other. You've also written about how this can help bridge divides that that exist between people. And I don't think we need to tell anyone how much of a problem that is in our own country right now. It's, I've, I've heard people say that we're at the most divided time in our history or, or you know, at least the most divided time in anyone's memory. Sure. You know, talk a little bit about the role that beauty can play in, in that. Yeah. I mean, I expect it would be hard to argue that we're more divided than during the Civil War, but we are the most divided, in, I'm sure, in anyone's memory. And this polarization is only tending to get worse. And so I've spent a bunch of time thinking about how do we find some ways that can bring people together that go beyond uh, polarization. And and I fixed on this idea of beauty because I thought that beauty was something, whether you're a liberal, a conservative, a socialist, whatever you are, beauty is something that matters to you. Uh, every conservative I know has a garden they're very proud of. They like to go out and, and hike and do things like that just as much as as the liberals do. So I felt that um, we could we could uh, if if we created a campaign around trying to beautify our cities and our our countries and restore the natural natural environment as well as um, changing our cities and things to make them more people friendly and more more beautiful 
uh, that we could attract uh, uh, interest and cooperation across these political lines. So I've been working on that for two years with a campaign called Anne Beauty for All. It's just annebeautyforall.org on the website. And while it's going slow because there, people have so many other things on their mind, uh, it's going, and I think it's working and going well. And I've had the opportunity to ad address conferences where there were, people were totally across the political spectrum and gotten positive response. One thing I noticed as I started Googling beauty, and, you know, I'm a liberal. I'm, I make no bones about that, but I I, I, I Googled beauty and beauty saving the world, you know, because of this statement by Doug Tompkins, who founded the uh, North Face and Esprit Clothing Companies, that he said, if anything can save the world, I'd put my money on beauty. And I kind of thought, well, that's a wager I'd like to test. And so I also looked that up. Uh, and to see who else had said things like that. And I was amazed to find that the first reference of beauty will save the world comes from Dostoevsky, who in The Idiot, his main character, Prince Mishkin, who is sort of considered a, 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 a kind of a naive young man because he's so idealistic, goes or one of the things that he's seen as silly for us, he goes around saying beauty will save the world. Uh, Solzhenitsyn in his 1970 Nobel address was called uh, Beauty Will Save the World, and he drew off da Dostoevsky, saying that this is something that can bring all the peoples of the world together. And then I also noticed that most of the articles written about beauty and the importance of beauty in our cities and so forth that I, I saw were actually written by people to the right of center in publications like the American Conservative and so forth. And that interested me. So I dug down, started reading some of those things, started contacting some of those authors and um, and found that we have we're having wonderful conversations. We do believe that, uh, you know, there are things we don't agree about, but we do believe uh, agree about beauty. We do believe about stewardship of the land, taking care of the land, making our cities more beautiful. And uh, so those are those are good dialogues that are starting, and uh, I, I I think we so need something in this country that does bring us together. You know, I'm 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 impressed and pleased by this whole new idea, which is taking steam, and uh, especially right at this very moment, called the Green New Deal, um, which uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and others have proposed, and. Uh, I certainly like the idea because I believe we need to do something serious about climate change. We need to have different technologies to to phase out fossil fuels and put funding into those things and all of that. I mean, there's a big technological aspect of the Green New Deal. But I also believe that we should think seriously about uh, beauty and greening uh, greening America and greening, re-greening our cities, both as carbon sinks, but also as places to approach nature and play. One of the things that I, I think ought to be a, a part of a Green New Deal would be the restoration of the Appalachian mountaintops. Uh, you know, 530 of these mountaintops have been completely leveled for coal strip mines. It causes enormous, enormous damage. And if we want to phase out coal, one of the things we do need to do is to find some work for the people who are mining the coal. And so in my view, what we ought to have those do is pay those people like we did with the CCC and the old New Deal to restore those mountaintops, fill them in, plant them with the, uh, diverse, diverse forests and things like that. But the impact of that, both for the climate and for, for those people in communities and areas, will be seen for years and generations to come in a positive way. So I think in the Green New Deal, we just have to think beyond that it's just about changing the technologies and say, no, it's about changing attitudes and it's about bringing nature back into the city and it's about really re-greening the country. Yeah, that's really amazing. I have not heard other people talk about that aspect of the Green New Deal. You know, I've heard about energy efficiency, which is, right. of course, incredibly uh, important, sustainable uh, sustainable energy and all of that. But, you know, what you're talking about is, uh, yeah, getting people jobs, but then changing the environments in which people then live from forever on after that. Right. So I've been working with some folks in a, and one of the places that really impresses me and I'm very excited about what they're doing is that 
is a city in California called Vallejo. Uh, it is a, a it's a seaport at the north end of San Francisco Bay. has about one hundred twenty five thousand people. Has been called by Brown University America's most diverse city because it literally is a quarter white, a quarter African American, a quarter Asian, and a quarter Hispanic. Uh, it is a poor community. It used to be the, the great uh, no, naval port in San Francisco Bay. It's where we built our ships, Navy ships, during World War II. And in 1998, the Navy, which was the main employer in town, pulled out. And the city sort of collapsed economically, went bankrupt, uh, had gangs and uh, crime, all kinds of problems. Property values dropped uh, enormously. Uh, the downtown became a ghost town. And, and it's actually coming back, interestingly, through developing around ideas of environmental restoration and beauty and attracting artists. So now those downtown uh, stores are are filled, the former stores, are, many of them are filled with artist studios. And the artists are beautifying, in, in many ways, uh, the city. But Vallejo has also found a way to pay young teenagers in poor neighborhoods to do reforestation, urban forestry, plant trees. They found an, a way to, to get people to restore wetlands on San Francisco Bay. And this has been so successful that in a matter of a couple of years, the number of birds coming back to the north part of San Francisco Bay has tripled. And it's become a, wow. a terrific wildlife viewing area. And they have an annual celebration of Vallejo called Visions of the Wild, which is about nature in the city. and and art, art, how art and nature go together, and how we can get our kids out into the natural world. Uh, I think it's a it's a very uh, exciting program uh, uh, led by um, the Filipino American Mayor Bob Sampayon, who's a very impressive guy. It's also about conserving open space. And what's happening is that people in the Bay Area are discovering Vallejo. The artists, other people are finding, hmm, I want to move there because it's a cool place. And there's uh, sharp people. And I think having those people in those places will probably attract the kind of industry that Vallejo wants. Because Vallejo has a choice. Some people want to put a big new cement plant in Vallejo. It's very polluting. The city essentially has turned that down and is actually really looking for the kinds of industry, which probably some of it is high tech, but also many other things that will be uh, that will be part of what they're doing so to me that's a very exciting thing that that's uh, happening in one city and i'm i'm glad to be involved with it in a small way i mean it's great it's always inspiring to know that you know that there are projects that are actually happening and are successful i think we often feel like we just can't get anything done uh, in this country you know, and uh, it's great to know that, yeah, things actually can get done when people work together on them. I think we see this at the local level all over America. I and mean, you can go to some of the even very conservative southern cities and see great efforts that have been done toward uh, beautification, toward walkways and and cleaning up old districts or making use of old buildings. Uh, Greenville, South Carolina, I think is a good example, but there there are many others at the local level. People get this. The real issue is how we bring these things to scale, how how we we you know build on them uh, at a larger level, I think as part of a Green New Deal. But I think there's a lot of exciting things going on in the country. And some of those things really do involve new technologies and the smart use of of new and appropriate uh, technologies, you know, but not all. But, you know, we know we're learning, for instance, agriculture is a technology. How we grow food and crops is a technology. And we're learning more and more things about that. And so we now have in places like Chicago, Milwaukee, Detroit, these cities where there was open space, factories had left, all of this. We have now extensive urban farms where the food is being grown by often African-American or Hispanic teenagers who earn an income doing it. It provides good, whole, wholesome food for, and, and I think you have this in New York too, and around uh, uh, for uh, local chefs. And so it's a, all these things are very uh, exciting 
examples. They're also beautiful. I mean, and they attract people to to see them and they get kids excited about life and growing and nature. Uh, uh, kids have left the gangs in, in places to uh, work in these urban farms and to grow things and have gotten excited about these things. And to me, that that's really neat to see. Yeah, it's, it's very inspiring. I'm sure people who are listening are wondering you know, how they can find out about whether there's anything like this going on in their community, how they can get involved in, uh, in Beauty for All, how they can get involved in any of these things around the country. Can they go to uh, your, your site or what would you recommend? Yeah, they can go to our site and beautyforall.org. Um, sign up for our free monthly newsletter because we try to profile some of these things that are going on. Um, we have a, uh, a blog every two weeks by somebody about usually about something that's happening in a place. Obviously we don't, we're not a clearinghouse that has information on all of these things that are, that are happening. But, um, but I think people will take some inspiration from our website. Uh, one of the things I just had a meeting in a little town called Calusa, California, uh, in a very, uh, conservative area of California. It's an area where people grow almonds and pistachios, essentially. It's a small town. And I met with people from the, the public library and from the uh, Arts Commission of the county and what's called the Calusa County Resource Conservation District, which is we have these in counties all over America. They came out of the old New, New Deal and they bring ranchers and farmers and scientists and agency people together to figure out how best to preserve soil, to protect the, uh, the environment and agriculture and so forth. But I had this meeting in, in Calusa, and they were looking for things that they could do to beautify the community and engage people in beauty across the political lines, which they, like every other place, have. And one of the people there, the assistant director of the Arts Commission, was from Ireland. And he talked, he pointed out something that they've been doing in Ireland since the 1950s, it has a kind of cute name, Tidy Towns, T-I-D-Y, Tidy Towns. Uh, and it originally started out as just a competition between all these Irish small towns about, you know, getting rid of litter and looking clean and, and spanking and this sort of stuff. But it's much, it's it's still going, but now it's much more about longer range sustainability, people friendliness, uh, equality, uh, you know, uh, parks and things, as well as as being being clean, and it's still an annual competition. And it's to me, it's a very healthy competition between between communities to to really say, hey, we want to make a livable, sustainable community that's beautiful. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, th thanks so much because um, I, I know people are going to feel motivated and energized by everything you've told them. Uh, to me, it's just a great antidote to the, the constant gloom and doom we hear about the country at the national level, which obviously there's a lot of truth to, you know, about things not getting done and, and programs not moving forward. So, you know, personally, I feel uh, uh, some renewed sense of, of hope from hearing from you about everything that people are doing to take things into their own hands at the local level where they live. Well, I think that's very, very important, uh, the spirit of place uh, and, and picking a place and doing something in that place. We can't forget the national level. I think we still, uh, you know, because it's possible that, that some good things done in a community can be destroyed in one fell swoop, as they would say, by some kind of government action, uh, you know, some deregulation or some regulation that comes from uh, a, a government agency can undercut what communities are trying to do. So we always have to keep an eye on what to do in Washington, D.C. But I think we also need to build from the bottom up. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's really, really helpful, inspiring note, I think, on which to end our conversation, although I'm sure we could keep going forever. <laughs> this sounds great. Yeah. I'm, I'm, and my, my throat is feeling it. So. <laughs> no, I, re I really appreciate it, John. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for being on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Oh, my, my pleasure, uh, Robert. You're doing great work and keep it up. Thanks for joining us for this Technology for Mindfulness podcast with me, Robert Plotkin. 
and today's guest, John DeGraff, the founder of And Beauty for All. Find out more about John and his organization and beauty for all at andbeautyforall.org. If you liked today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes and share the episode with your friends. Those and all other links are in the show notes. And check out our blog at technologyformindfulness.com for information and tips about science, technology, and mindfulness. If you liked today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes and share the episode with your friends. Those and all other links are in the show notes. And check out our blog at technologyformindfulness.com for information and tips about science, technology, and mindfulness. And find out about our Tap Into Mindfulness course for helping you to take control of your smartphone at tapintomindfulness.com. I'm Robert Plotkin, and I'll join you next time on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast with guests Marla Mattinson and Julian Coker for a special Valentine's Day episode of the Technology for Mindfulness podcast, where we'll talk about bringing mindfulness to our intimate relationships.